Yes, George Gissing was a late Victorian novelist, highly recommended. <clears throat> um, there'll be a short and written test on him the next time I see you. Okay, as I've said to one or two of you privately, I think I'm beginning to lose my voice. Um, I'm talking to you today. The semester starts a week today, so of course, this is the time when I lose my voice. Okay, I want to talk a little about trigger warnings, uh, microaggressions, checking your privilege, and one or two other aspects of life in the contemporary academy. It's worse than you think. No matter how bad you think it is, it's worse. Some of you, no doubt, have children um, in college, and you've been to UW Washkosh, UW Green Bay half a dozen times or more, but I think that you need to live and work in academia day by day to have any real idea of how biased culturally and politically the academy is. <clears throat> um, things are so bad that I now decline to go, if I possibly can, to dinner parties with people I don't know. I work for UW Fox, my wife works for St. Norbert College, and so inevitably a lot of the people we know are academics. My wife has to use a mixture of threats and bribery to get me to go to a, a dinner party with people I haven't met before. Because I know that I'm going to be the only non-liberal sitting around the table. It's taken as a given that you're a liberal. Um, I went to a conference a few weeks ago, a Dickens conference, and one of the speakers in the middle of his presentation suddenly introduced a jeer at Fox News. Entirely irrelevant to what he was talking about. Entirely gratuitous. And he expected a chuckle, and uh, he, generally speaking, he got one. He knew his audience. I went to another conference <clears throat> a year ago or so in Poland, and I forget the name of the village we were taken to afterwards as a sort of trip. And even if I knew it, I couldn't pronounce it, I'm sure. But according to the faithful, the Virgin Mary appeared in this Polish village. And there's a church built to commemorate her appearances. Um, it was taken as a matter of course by the people, my fellow conference attenders, that this had never happened, that only a credulous fool would believe in it, um, that religion, Christianity especially, is a fraud. <clears throat> so that's the general atmosphere, I think, of academia. I would guess that something like 93, 96% of my colleagues at UW Fox have voted for Obama twice. And okay, there's nothing wrong with that. I'm not saying that voting for Obama is incompatible with personal decency. But I do think that one or two of my colleagues think that not voting for Obama is incompatible with personal decency. <clears throat> okay, um, trigger warnings. If you don't know what they are, academics in some institutions are now being encouraged to put warnings on their syllabi about potentially troublesome matters. Um, failing that, some academics are being encouraged to give explicit warnings before a particular assignment in case the reading or the work connected with the assignments triggers a form of post-traumatic stress syndrome. The University of California, Santa Barbara, um, has a resolution to mandate warnings for triggering content in academic settings. And I won't read out the whole thing, but here's some of them. Whereas UCSB Care, Campus Advocacy Resources and Education, reports that one in four college women will be sexually assaulted during her academic career, one in four women, women will experience domestic violence, and one in 33 men will experience attempted or completed rape. Therefore, this is a pertinent and widespread issue that should be acknowledged on campus. Now, you've heard before, perhaps, the one in four figure, one in four women will be raped or suffer sexual assault in college. That figure has been widely criticised. And I think there are two possibilities. Either it's true, and we are living in what is perhaps the most vile society the world has ever seen, 25% of women sexually assaulted, 
or the figure is doctored, the figure is unreliable, <coughs> the figure is politicized. And I know where I stand with regard to that choice between the two possibilities. Whereas the current suggested list of trigger warnings includes rape, sexual assault, abuse, self-injurious behavior, suicide, graphic violence, pornography, kidnapping, and graphic depictions of gore. Now, the copy I'm reading from has the word gore, beginning with a capital G, but I don't think the writer's suggesting that um, any depictions of owl should come with a trigger warning. That's not the purpose. Um, whereas triggers are a symptom of PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, Whereas UCSB Disabled Students Program recognizes PTSD as a disability. Whereas having memories or flashbacks triggered can cause the person severe emotional, mental, and even physical distress. <coughs> These reactions can affect a student's ability to perform academically. Just a little bit more. Whereas college level courses may contain materials with mature content. These particularly affect students if material is being read in the classroom or a film is being screened, as the student cannot choose to stop being exposed to the material. Whereas including trigger warnings is not a form of criticism or censorship of content. In addition, it does not restrict academic freedom, but simply requests the respect and acknowledgement of the effect of triggering content on students with PTSD, both diagnosed and undiagnosed. Okay, one more perhaps. Whereas being informed well in advance of triggering content allows students to avoid a potentially triggering situation without public attention. Having a trigger warning on a syllabus allows the student the choice to be pre present, gives the student notice of possible triggers, and um, enables the student to, leave, um, to avoid the class rather than leaving in the middle of a class or lecture. Now, to my mind, there are one or two problems with the idea of trigger warnings. And perhaps the most salient of the problems is that almost no work of literature is devoid of some potential offense. Okay? Almost no work of literature. Um, I teach a fellow regularly. Um, am I supposed to put at the beginning of my lectures on Othello may trigger unfortunate responses in those who have been the victim of racism? Um, if you remember Othello's last speech before he kills himself, he talks about having killed a Muslim in present day Aleppo in Syria. And he describes the Muslim in stereotypical terms. Am I supposed to put a trigger about Islamophobia at the beginning of my lectures? Um, you've all heard perhaps of the tensions surrounding the teaching of Huckleberry Finn, because Huckleberry Finn has the N word. Every semester I teach Martin Luther King's letter from Birmingham jail. Martin Luther King uses the N word and writes it out in full. He disapproves of the N-word, of course, and so do I, but he writes it out in full, and when I read the relevant paragraph, I say it. But my students are highly sensitive about that word. They won't even write it, some of them. They either write the N-word, or they write N with five apostroph um, asterisks after it. So, there are various problems, to my mind, with the trigger warning movement. I think for one thing, it tends to infantilize students. Um, it tends to encourage the cult of the victim. And we know, do we not, that being a victim in this culture, in this society, paradoxically is a source of power. It's a source of moral power, isn't it? If you can claim that you've been on the receiving end of some sort of prejudice, then you acquire some sort of cultural power over people who have not. The use of the trigger warning also buys into the world of the left. Um, simply to write the thing and put it on your syllabus takes you into this world of oppressors and victims. This cultural Marxist world where one either oppresses or is oppressed. Some of the language that will be used in trigger warnings implies presupposes a certain political position. 
homophobia, for example. Homophobia implies, does it not, that opposition to homosexual marriage, for example, is the product of irrational fear. It's the product of bigotry. That's what a phobia is. If you are throwing around the word, the word homophobia, you are implicitly denying that people can respect individual homosexuals but disapprove of homosexual behavior, homosexual congress. The same thing applies with the word Islamophobia. Again, the implication is that criticism of Islamic terrorists is motivated by irrational fears, irrational resentments. There is no acknowledgement in the use of that word that perhaps one could talk about the history of the last 14 centuries and say that some aspects of Islam, including the impetus towards jihad, are highly problematic for non-Muslims. Okay, um, I also think that this trigger warning thing is finally unnecessary. What does an experienced instructor do? He tells his students in advance if a particular movie is going to be potentially distressing. Now, I've taught *A Clockwork Orange by Anthony Burgess, which you may have heard of, you may have read. Um, I've never seen the movie because I remember when it first came out in the late 1980s, it was notoriously violent. Now, if I were to teach *A Clockwork Orange, which I have done, and then show the movie, which I've not done, what would I do? I'd do the sensible thing. I'd say to my students, look, this has a reputation as a very violent movie. If you don't like that sort of thing, don't attend. Obviously, your absence will not count against you. And that's common sense. I once taught a novel called The Red Sorghum, a Chinese novel by a man called Mo Yan. There is a very graphic description in that novel of a man being skinned alive. And that description was very upsetting, I saw, to one or two students. Um, this would be more than a decade ago. But I can still see distress in the faces of the students, one or two of them, who found that scene very unpleasant. So what did I do? I made the common sense decision, and I've never taught Red Sorghum a second time. It's not worth it. It's too painful for the students. You will have heard of Vladimir Nabokov's Lolita, um, which talks of the relationship between an adult male and a well, pre-adolescent girl. Some of my students found that book offensive, and I tried to explain why, in fact, it should be treated, well, with intellectual respect. But I couldn't get beyond the objection that some students had to this depiction of a relationship between an adult male and a pre-adolescent girl. I decided eventually I'm not going to teach Lolita again. It's not worth it, okay? Teaching can be difficult enough if you have people who, I mean, with good reasons in some ways, violent, not violently, strongly object to a certain theme, you think twice about whether you teach that book again. Okay, I teach Oliver Twist pretty much every semester. I don't know how many English majors I'm talking to, um, but many of you will have read Oliver Twist. Am I, in all seriousness, expected to put on my syllabus um, graphic depictions of crime, graphic depictions of poverty, and of course, if you remember the figures, Fagan, ethnic stereotyping. Now, I can talk to the class and say, look, this is, the figure of Fagan is in some ways offensive. Um, you must bear in mind it's pre-Holocaust. Um, Dickens, I think, had the sort of casual, mild anti-Semitism that many people in his time and place did have. We need to understand the book in its historical context. To be fair to the left, even one or two people from the left have objected to um, trigger warnings. And I thought it might be interesting and amusing, well, mildly amusing perhaps, to point out the mockery that some people have made of it as follows. There's somebody called Professor Zimmerman, um, who teaches Introduction to the United States, to the History of the United States. And he's fantasizing about the trigger warnings he should perhaps put on his syllabus as follows. Um, he warns Quakers and Catholics that the Puritans sometimes cut off your ears and bore out your tongues, so skip this week if you don't want to talk or hear about that. Ditto for practitioners of Wicca, who will surely be alarmed by the trials of their sister witches at Salem. 
when the class covers prohibition on the Roaring Twenties, Zimmerman puts a trigger alert for Italian Americans and accounting majors who may take issue with Al Capone's massive crime ring in which he was arrested for tax evasion. For World War II, Professor Zimmerman says, there's no need for Germans, Italians, or Japanese folks to show up to class. Quote, we won, they lost. Any questions? <laughs> for the Cold War, Professor Zimmerman says, it's not a good week to be a communist, or even someone who seems like a communist. You know who you are. A final zinger for the Clinton years. Let's imagine that your dad had an affair with a younger, okay, much younger, Work associates, if you don't want to go there, you don't want to come to this class either. It's pretty gross. The National Association of Scholars, which is, relatively speaking, a conservative group for people who work in universities. And of course, its membership is therefore far, far smaller than the membership of corresponding leftist groups. But the National Association of Scholars organized a competition uh, for the best or the worst trigger warnings. A few of them as follows. One flew over the cuckoo's, ne cuckoo's nest. Warning, may contain nuts. <laughs> Green eggs and ham. Warning, glorifies GMOs. Les Miserables. May cause paranoia in students with a history of shoplifting, especially food items. <laughs> no country for old men. Exclusion of the elderly. Cask of Amontillado. Abject insensitivity to the difficulties involved in bricklaying. Okay. Don Quixote. Scenes of graphic violence against alternative energy sources. <laughs> Beowulf. Depictions of violence against endangered species. Treasure Island. This one's my personal favourite. Offensive portrayals of transnational nautical entrepreneurs. <laughs> and finally, Confessions of St. Augustine, narrow-minded treatments of Carthaginian hookup culture. Okay. Of course, the... Okay, I'll move on to another subject in a few seconds. But of course, the um, trigger warning attitude is going to be used, is being used to push leftist causes. Um, Oberlin recently introduced, and I think then withdrew, I'm not quite sure, the trigger warning mandate. And um, Oberlin, the Oberlin Guide reads as follows. Okay, here's the sort of thing you might say to your students. We are reading this work in spite of the author's racist frameworks because his work was foundational in establishing the field of anthropology and because I think together we can challenge, deconstruct, and learn from his mistakes. So it's pushing politics in the classroom. Okay. Checking your privilege. Checking your privilege, apparently, is just a little bit old hat, and it seems to be going out of fashion. But it's, well, okay, it's a way of questioning your right to comment on certain matters. And it does what leftist approaches very often do, as, a, as referred to by David, it sees you as a member of a group, according to the color of your skin, according to your gender, that is how you are to be judged. That's how you are to be estimated, not as an individual. If you are a traditionally privileged person, if that is to say you are a heterosexual, white male in particular, somebody could say to you, check your privilege when that somebody hears an argument he doesn't like. It's a form, to my mind, a relatively sophisticated form, but a form of ad hominem. You know about, about, about ad hominems? Ad hominems criticise the arguer instead of the argument. Uh, you're a bad man. It's well known that you're a bad man. Um, don't enter this fray. Or maybe you are a bad man, but maybe you are right about whatever it is we're arguing about, and I'm mistaken. Ad hominem says that people with privilege, conceived in terms of group membership, race, class, gender, people traditionally perceived as privileged should be extremely wary about what they say, 
It's a way of undercutting any arguments you may make that may be distasteful to the opposition. Okay, a couple more things. Um, microaggressions. Have we heard about microaggressions? We live in what is, and I'm not saying this to flatter you, I'm saying it because I think it's true, the freest country in the world. We live in a country that's made tremendous efforts to wipe out racism, the civil war, the great society, etc. Okay, racism to some extent inevitably does exist, but it's completely frowned upon in anything approaching respectable society. If you can't find an explicitly racist comment or attitude, then you talk about microaggressions. And microaggressions can be something as simple as minor, as a look, a shrug, um, getting somebody's name wrong. A microaggression is perceived as being a manifestation of the hidden racism that is deep inside you, at least if you're white. And finally, I want to make a quick reference to the White Privilege Conference in Madison, which some of you will have heard about. And I want to quote something by Kim Randersma, if that's how she pronounces her name, of whom I've heard before. She's a Wisconsin teacher, <coughs> a former high school English teacher. And at this conference, <coughs> excuse me, she hosted a session entitled Stories from the Front Lines of Education, Confessions of a White High School English Teacher. She said that teaching is a purely political act and that neutral people should, quote, get the F out of here. No, she didn't say F. She said the whole one syllable word. She also explained, quote, being a white person who does anti-racist work is like being an alcoholic. I will never be recovered by my alcoholism, to use the metaphor. I have to wake every day and acknowledge that I am so deeply embedded with racist thoughts and notions and actions in my body that I have to choose every day to do anti-racist work and think in an anti-racist way. Now, that seems to me to be almost literally mad. Okay? I mean, removed from reality. So, there are lots of excellent instructors in Wisconsin and American universities. And there are lots of excellent instructors who do their best not to reveal their politics to their students. And I know some of them at UW Fox. It's undeniable that the overwhelming bias in academia is to the left, and even considerably to the left. And you may wish to bear that in mind when your children go off to wherever and um, think about what they're being taught. Thank you. Questions uh, we can shoot at them? Like yeah. Would the liberal bias extend to Christian universities? Less so. Less so, but I think it's still there. Now, a few days ago, I was so foolish as to get into a Facebook discussion about racism. I responded to a comment made by a local deacon who's entirely a good guy. Um, this guy said, If you hear somebody claim that he's been on the receiving end of racist oppression, all you can do is say, I'm sorry. And I politely, I objected to that. Um, and I said, no, actually, the first thing you do is find out if the claim is justified. Evidence, please, when, where, what, by whom. And if the claim is justified, then and only then you say, I'm sorry. And of course, I was accused of being a racist. Um, the people who supported the deacon, I'm sure, were all Christians. They knew him from church. Um, but Christianity and left-wing politics are not mutually exclusive. Yes? Uh, an observation and a question. The first observation was, I noticed in both college and graduate school that the professors with a conservative bent tended to be the better teachers, uh, had the larger classes, and um, overall were more popular. But my question as an aspiring academic who's a far-right conservative, how, how can I encourage more of my friends with graduate degrees to get into academia, to wipe out this 1960s era hippie bias that exists in many of our universities and graduate schools today? 
Well, I'll give you an honest answer if you don't mind. I hope it's not too depressing. Change your career plans. Okay? Um, I don't want to over-dramatise, but I think you could well be a target. Okay? I think unpleasant things are going to happen to you. Now, no matter how wonderful you turn out to be as a teacher and a scholar, uh, you're going to be known as the conservative guy. And I have colleagues, everybody who works in a university has colleagues, who cannot hear the other side. They can hardly bear even to hear the other side. They take personal offence if the other side is expressed. Okay? And that is not an exaggeration. So with all due respect to this gentleman, you can do better. I just wanted to make a comment. I uh, attended a, one of my children a white coat ceremony last week as she's entering a, a medical uh, education. And I, the speaker firstly used the word social justice. Yep. The speaker was from a, a union, you could say, a medical union. And I thought, okay, that's interesting. But then a big theme, other than enjoy the ride, study hard and all that, was you are privileged. Yep. And I'm thinking the cost of probably at least seventy thousand per year yep. to go to the school for four years. They have worked very hard and they've been selected. It was it was a selected group, half men, half women, and it was a, a racial bit. But I thought they want them to feel that they're privileged in a way that they must give back because <coughs> it, it, it's um, mm -hmm. rather than being raised to want to give to society. They push the, you are privileged, you must give back for social justice. Mm -hmm. I was very surprised in graduate school to, to have that so obviously, and I don't think the children, the young students really understood it the way those of us who are older. Yep. Yep. Well, social justice is a code phrase for left-wing um, agenda, especially re income redistribution. So, yeah. Yes? Professor, I'm just wondering, when you're working, who do you get to talk to? <laughs> I had four children that I sent through, that my wife and I sent through Catholic school from kindergarten to possibly college. And all the Catholic colleges were in this state. And every one of them had a height, they're Christian conservative, yeah. did serve their grades. Yeah. 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 Who do I talk to? Well, I've been there for 24 years. I'm a known quantity. There's a certain amount of, well, that's just Malcolm. Let's put up with it. Um, there are people who very much prefer not to talk to me, and I prefer not to talk to them. But we rub along. We have to. I'm a tenured full professor. So there's nothing very much they can do to me. Okay. They can't get rid of me unless I murder a student or something. Well, along the way, what's been your experience dealing with the administration at your college? I'm sorry, my experience? In dealing with the administration, being a conservative. It depends on the administrator. Now, the present dean at UW Fox is entirely a good guy. And I'm sure he doesn't share my politics, but um, there's no problem whatsoever. Um, I did have problems with his predecessor and part of the source of those problems I think was political disagreements. So it depends on how scrupulous the individual administrator is. And some of them, lots of them do try to be scrupulous. Yes? Um, with these trigger warnings, getting back to the idea, especially like with English folks being able to put good novels Yes, yes, of course, of course. Yes, excellent question, excellent question, you can't. Um, good novels almost inevitably involve disquieting material of one sort or another. Um, that's why they're good novels. Yes. Given the bias you describe against uh, conservative academics, uh, how did you happen to become successful at being an academic then? How does one get tenure, for example, or even get hired if the hire, the people doing the hiring are very left-wing and sort of pulled together to exclude yep. conservatives? Are you just 
sort of uh, the token conservative so that they can say, see, we're not 100% biased? Okay. Or, or how did you manage to get okay. through this uh, over the years? I arrived in Wisconsin in 1990, and I'd spent the previous 13 or 14 years elsewhere. So when I came back to the US in 1990, I was out of the loop, and I didn't know what went on um, in American universities in terms of political predisposition. And I was very busy trying to get tenure. Um, it wasn't until 1994 that I began to see what was happening around me. And in 1994, I got tenure. So by the time I realized, I was already safely ensconced. And the way I realized what was going on, and I mentioned this briefly, I think, the last time I spoke to you, I went to a conference and I gave a talk on English women travelers in the Middle East. And um, I assumed a light tone and told a few mildly amusing stories about adventurous women. And it was made very clear to me, indeed, that you don't speak lightly about women writers. The only appropriate attitude is one of submissive respect. And after I'd given my talk, I spent the rest of the conference eating alone and walking from one session to the next alone because, I'm not joking, I'm not exaggerating, nobody would talk to me. Um, I'm not quite sure of the context in which you'd say that. Students do have rights, um, but students also know that the grade is under the control of the professor, don't they? Um, there's a power disparity. Now, lefties usually disapprove of power disparities, except in this particular case when it suits them. <laughs> and then I said, finally I got him to shut up when I said, you know, that was very disrespectful when Tom Baird, when he conceded his election, got slapped in the face. I was so shocked that somebody, a supporter of his, was asked to be so rude and slapped yes. in the face, yes. and they shut right up. Yes. There's a book written by somebody whose name I forget, forget for the moment about bias in academia. And the title is what he once heard somebody say, quote, I can't believe I'm sitting next to a Republican. No, not as far as I can see. I think it's going to get worse before it gets better. Now, again, I can't quote the statistics offhand. I don't remember them. Um, but there used to be a time when there would be eight Democrats to five Republicans in the University of California system. Um, the proportion for assistant professors, that is the lowest of the three big ranks, the proportion in the University of California for assistant professors is something like 84 to 1. 84 liberals to 1 conservative. Those assistant professors are going to be around for 25 or 30 years. They're going to get promoted to associate professor and to full professor, and they're going to influence their students. Um, I don't see any way out. And to answer your first question, it's worse than you know because understandably and pardonably, you don't know how deeply embedded it is. It's simply taken for granted that leftist positions are good, compassionate, and noble. And non-leftist positions are at the least suspect. Now, I could go on about this all day. Um, just one more anecdote. I went to another conference um, a few weeks ago. Actually, the same one as the, it was the Dickens conference, the same one I referred to before. And we were chatting about this, that, and the other, at this so-called banquet at the end of the conference. 
And I said something, I don't remember what, that made it clear that my politics are different from those of the people around me. Um, and the guy sitting next to me, an old friend of mine, uh, laughed and he thumped me on the back and said to the table, he's a Republican. And I said, no, 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 I'm a conservative. Um, incredulity was the response of the people around me. Okay? Now, they were not rude, but actually they were sort of friendly, but simple incredulity. They couldn't believe it. They think that any level of intelligence and conservative politics are mutually exclusive. And some of them, as I've said, think that personal decency and conservative politics are mutually exclusive. You're a bad person if you don't support abortion, homosexual marriage, etc. Um, they do, they do. But that's a very complicated subject. But yes, I mean, there's doubts. You know, there's a popular Christian movie out today called Not a Giant Jack, and uh, it circulates around the idea that a college professor who is an atheist and is in there and uh, all this uh, allows his own students to come in and see this religion uh, and wants to enter the class. And you know, you watch the movie and you can hear uh, that you know this this uh, group is sort of get in and, and make off the students. And the, the problem was uh, having dealt with colleges and universities since uh, 1970 myself. Um, that is never going to happen because they're not going to allow you. And the one mm -hmm. statement you made around me that's very true is the, the one person in that classroom who who is closest to being God is the professor. Mm -hmm. The yeah. professor is yeah. not. Going yeah. And I, I have people in the room with me who are in their 20s and 30s, some college students, who made the comment when that scene came on that this can't possibly be true, that's illegal, it's, it's wrong, that can't be happening. And I turned to them and said, in 1971, I walked into my first college class, which was Psychology 1, in a California university, and the professor jumped up on top of his desk, stomped his feet like a two-year-old, screamed at the top of his lungs, and then asked the 162-year-old amphitheater if any of them were these believers in this mythological, magical God that can reach down and do things for people and, and change things on Earth. And three or four timid yeah, people kind of stuck yep. hand up like yep. this. This is 1971, and he noted who they were, and then he made the statement, it will be my major responsibility during this semester to divest you of your mythology. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep, yep. A telling story. I'm wondering if David wants me to shut up and sit down now. Anybody else have any questions? Yeah, you got one, and I want to throw one at him, and then we'll, we'll let him sit down. <laughs> well, I've got all kinds of questions. Um, I've been sitting there thinking, you know, years ago when I was at Madison, the bottom of Aspen Hill, was a sign that probably still is. It talks about the Sistons and the Winnemean of Truth. And, um, and I'm thinking your beginning period in the 80s when I started off the program was an excuse. You basically didn't want to rent to the lesbian. And then comes the concept of the hate crime. Mm -hmm. Well, <clears throat> and I'm asking myself this question. Um, isn't this a form of hate that is actually being practiced within academia? And if that was provable, why don't we find a way to utilize the hate crime against those who have been using it against us? Yep. So, so that mm -hmm. would be one. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the other thing that I'd like to just comment on is <clears throat> the gentlemen in our community, some of you know him better than I do, uh, Tim Higgins, I believe his name is, newly appointed to the trustee uh, to the Regents, uh, UW Regents. And um, sitting there saying to myself, I think we ought to try to find a way to have a confrontation, if you want to use that word, or a discussion, if you want to use another word, with some of these Regents who obviously have some authority mm -hmm. in some of these areas. Now, that's a comment. I know very little about regions. I have nothing to do with them in my day-to-day -day work. 
Um, but yes, I mean, it sounds a good idea. Your first suggestion, I'm not a lawyer, I don't know if it would work or not. Um, if somebody makes a comment about stupid, racist, white males, is that hate speech? And if it isn't, why isn't it? But whether that would fly in the court of law, I have no idea. I have no idea. I just wanted to throw one question in and then hopefully we can segue on to other things. Has anybody ever nailed down a definition of racism, of privilege? I mean, is this like nailing jelly to a wall, or do they have a pretty good definition of this? So that you can at least argue intelligently with them. If you're white, male, and heterosexual, you're privileged. Even if your father was out of work for the last 20 years, even if you yourself are plagued by depression, it doesn't matter. Um, if you're white, heterosexual, male, you're privileged. And therefore, morally, at the bottom of the totem pole. Sorry. Well, I guess that is uh, that's it. Thank you very much, Mark. That's it.